Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings. We're broadcasting today from the stage of the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center, where last night we had our annual meeting, the 149th Annual Meeting of the Naval Institute, which was a great event, including the American Sea Power Project panel that featured uh, former Secretary John Lehman, uh, Sally Payne from the Naval War College, and um, I'm drawing a blank on uh, Tom Mankin, Tom Mankin from CSBA. Uh, but it was a great conversation. And uh, with me today, my guest is uh, retired Admiral Harry Harris, United States Navy, who served uh, most famously as the Indo-PACOM commander. Or I guess when you were there, you were just, just PACOM. PACOM, still called PACOM. Now the Indo-PACOM commander. And then after his retirement, he served as the U.S. ambassador to the Republic of Korea. Uh, Admiral Harris graduated from the Naval Academy in 1978. He was a P-3 naval aviator. He commanded a P-3 squadron, VP-46. He commanded Patrol Wing 1. And uh, later, the U.S. Sixth Fleet, the U.S. Pacific Fleet, in uh, U.S. Pacific Command, and then, as I mentioned, was the ambassador to the Republic of Korea. Admiral, <clears throat> welcome to the show. Hey, Bill, thanks a lot. Uh, it's, it's great to be part of the Naval Institute and all the great stuff that it does. And I'm, uh, I'm uh, pleased to be on your podcast and all the great things that you do for the Institute. Well, Admiral Harris is with me today because he's here for the Board of Directors meeting, and he is one of the new three newly elected members of the Board of Directors uh, of the Naval Institute. So it's great to have you on yeah. our board, sir. Great to be here. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start, if we could, on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, so you served as the PACOM commander and the ambassador to the Republic of Korea. Uh, Korea's attitude toward its military appears to have changed pretty markedly in recent years. Uh, your opinion, I'm just curious, is that a, a, merely a change in government attitude, or does it reflect a change in the popular opinion towards the military? Yeah, it's a great question, uh, Bill. The, um, South Korea, uh, as a government, is a democracy, uh, and so uh, the elected officials, uh, just like in the United States, uh, they reflect the will of the people. So the people uh, voted uh, for uh, the opposition party, what was the opposition party when I was there. Um, and uh, so uh, in response to your question, yes, uh, it does reflect the will of the people. Uh, I do believe that this new administration uh, will put greater emphasis uh, on the alliance uh, with the United States. Uh, they'll put greater emphasis on, on what is, in my view, the correct uh, um, description of North Korea uh, as their number one enemy. We went away from that description under the previous administration, uh, South Korean administration, uh, and I think that the new administration is off on the right foot. Uh, it, it is also uh, important to note uh, that now President Yoon uh, has made the, uh, the relationship with Japan a centerpiece of his uh, campaign, that he wants to see an improvement uh, in the bilateral relationship between South Korea and Japan. And I'll note also that Prime Minister Kishida uh, in Japan also is seeking ways to improve that relationship. Uh, it's a relationship that's, that's fraught with uh, the, the, the bad history between the two countries, uh, but, but they are also our key allies uh, in Northeast Asia. Uh, and so the trilateral relationship between the United States, South Korea, uh, and Japan is so important but it is hampered by the bilateral relationship between Seoul and Tokyo. So um, I'm, I'm uh, excited and uh, looking forward to hearing good things uh, from this new administration in Korea, both on, uh, on, on the security alliance with the United States, uh, on uh, the importance of, uh, of correctly characterizing North Korea, uh, and on the trilateral and bilateral front with Japan. Uh, I know that uh, the Republic of Korea is facing a demographic challenge uh, similar to that in Japan with an aging population, low birth weight. Uh, some of our European allies also have uh, similar demographic challenges. How do you think that will play out in terms of impacting their military over the coming decades? Well, I mean, it's certainly they have to consider it. You know, they have uh, 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 a birth rate below 1.0. Uh, I think they're the first uh, industrial country to... Uh, to, to dip down that low. Uh, and they recognize that their military, that, that their birth rate uh, won't sustain the current military they have over time. Uh, 
Uh, and so, uh, but uh, and so because they are a high tech nation, an innovation nation, I used to call them. Uh, you know, already they're considering things like robotics and AI and ways to uh, to uh, continue uh, their security programs, their defense programs, with less manpower. Got it. So uh, a birth rate of 2.0 is not even sustaining birth rate, right. right? So if a woman has, you know, the average woman has 2.2 or so, right. it's kind of the sustaining birth rate. So they're below 1.0. If they're below 1.0, that is really a, a significant yeah. challenge, yeah, demographically. Yeah. Interesting. Um, uh, much has been written about uh, the need for strong alliances in the Pacific to offset China's growing military power. We talked about that last night uh, here at the annual meeting. Um, and you just hinted at this, but how's progress going in getting the ROC military to work more closely with the Japan Self-Defense Force? Yeah. And so, um, as I mentioned before, the challenges of history are hard to overcome. Um, and uh, the, uh, the history between Seoul and Tokyo uh, is complicated uh, and it's, it's hindered by the, by the truly brutal uh, uh, occupation of the Korean Peninsula by Japan uh, from the early 1900s until 1945. Uh, and from that, you have the issues that are playing out even today, the comfort women issue in South Korea and the forced labor issue uh, in South Korea. And, and that relationship, that history, uh, has complicated the, the ability of the two nations uh, to get along uh, in any productive way. Uh, they had a peace treaty uh, in the early 60s uh, that Japan maintains, uh, addressed all of those issues. Mm. Uh, the, the South Korean Supreme Court ruled uh, a few years ago that it did not. Uh, and so there are, there are those issues that are resident. They are not insignificant. Uh, and uh, they played out while I was the ambassador there. Uh, Japan and South Korea uh, have a bilateral security information sharing uh, arrangement. Uh, the, the South Korea threatened to pull out of that arrangement. Uh, and it took a lot of pressure from the United States, from the State Department, from the embassy, from the military side uh, to, keep, uh, uh, to keep South Korea in that arrangement. Uh, so it is fraught with peril. Uh, that said, you would think that, that the two countries who have the same uh, security ally with the, uh, alliance with the United States, uh, they face the same threat from North Korea, they face the same challenges from, uh, uh, from the Pe People's Republic of China, that they will get along. But they don't because it's complicated by their histories. That affects their military bilateral relationship as well mm. because the militaries follow the uh, orders uh, of the National Command Authorities uh, in both of those countries because they're both democracies. Uh, their military share this, the similar equipment, uh, Aegis missile systems. Uh, uh, South Korea has the P-8 uh, Poseidon. Uh, the, the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force has the P-1, the indigenous ASW aircraft with, with a lot of common equipment, uh, helicopters, uh, the whole range of, of things between the two militaries. Uh, and and uh, so interoperability uh, should not be an issue, but it's not the equipment that, that uh, uh, where the challenges are manifest. Uh, it's, the ability of the, it's the ability of the two uh, navies uh, to be able to work together. If, if they could work together uh, from a national level, then, then they can work together because uh, they have the same procedures, the same equipment, and all of that. But it's driven by the national uh, uh, political dynamic uh, in uh, Seoul and Tokyo. Yeah, the, the, the history continues to impact the human level of trust. That's correct. Yeah, there, there's, uh, there's a complete lack of trust, in my opinion, uh, between the two militaries, which is really a subset of the lack of trust between governments. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be frank with you, uh, over time, uh, both uh, governments use the political divisions uh, with the other country uh, for domestic political gain. So that, that makes it complicated. That makes it hard. You know, the, the two countries can't even agree uh, on the name of the body of water that separates them. 
you know, is it the Sea of Japan? Is it the East Sea? You know, they have um, island disputes like, uh, like a lot of countries do. Uh, there's a group of rocks uh, that's in that body of water. Uh, is it uh, uh, Dokdo or is it Takashima Do? Uh, you know, so uh, if you can't agree on those things, then it's hard to imagine that they can agree on bigger things. However, uh, like I said in, the, in the response to your first question, I'm optimistic. Now, uh, more than ever, uh, because of uh, President Yoon's commitment and uh, Prime Minister Kishida's commitment uh, to w either work through the historical issues or put aside the historical issues because of the immediacy of the threat from North Korea. And does the uh, immediacy of the threat from China play into that as well? Yeah, uh, I, I would say that from the two countries' perspectives, uh, the view of China is less of a threat than a big challenge. Gotcha. Certainly from the Korean perspective. I believe that Japan's view of China is moving into that threat categorization, as it is with us. Yep. Uh, but uh, uh, South Korea has tried uh, to balance uh, its position. You know, they like to say they're a shrimp among whales, which, which is not true when you consider that that they're the 10th largest economy in the world, innovation nation, like I mentioned before, cultural and, and economic powerhouse and right. all of that. But they like to say that. And, uh, um, and, and they, they do have uh, the, 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 the PRC uh, as a neighbor. So they have that uh, on their uh, immediate border. So they have to deal with that, right? right. Uh, but, uh, you know, the... the the PRC is South Korea's number one trading partner. Nothing wrong with that. You know, uh, we are a big, uh, we have a big economic trading relationship with the PRC also. Um, but Washington and Beijing fundamentally disagree uh, on the way ahead in the rules-based international order. Um, and so the the the, uh, the Koreans often view uh, that as us asking them to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And I, I always told them that that's a false narrative designed to sow doubt about the strength and history of the U.S.-South Korean alliance. Uh, that the United States did make a choice in 1950 when we decided that we would send our treasure and troops and money uh, to defend South Korea against the communist invasion from the north. And the South Koreans made their choice also already in 1953 when they uh, allied with the U.S. formally the, the treaty uh, between us, uh, and they aligned with the West. So the choices were already made. Yeah. So this is this is uh, a false narrative to suggest that we want them to make the, a choice again. They've already made that choice. Uh, so uh, uh, so they, 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 their view, I think, of the PRC is shifting also with this new administration. Um, so we'll have to see how it goes. You know, it's early days yet. Uh, yeah. President Yoon has been in, in power for two days. So, you know. <laughs> um, let, let's dig down a little bit on the, the ROC, the Republic of Korea's military for a minute. I just want to, you know, you mentioned that they, they have now again sort of formally um, recognized that their neighbor to the north, the DPRK, as, as their number one threat, right? So is their military, is it designed, is that what they designed their military for, mm -hmm. is the North Korean threat? Or, or is there some hedge towards the capabilities that the Chinese are building too? Uh, I, I think that they're starting to do that now. Uh, but their military is focused on uh, the war that never ended. Right? Yeah. We, um, we're only in an armistice with North Korea. And, and we see Kim Jong-un's continued belligerence uh, and aggressive rhetoric towards South Korea. And so uh, their military is correctly focused on North Korea, whether it's their, their ROK Air Force, the Republic of Korea Air Force, uh, Army, the Marine Corps, or Navy. Uh, that said, uh, their Navy is, is, is an international, uh, internationally capable Navy. Uh, Blue Water Navy, deep, you know, b uh, cruisers, destroyers, uh, destroyers for sure, uh, and submarines. And we see them in RIMPAC. Uh, we see them in the Middle East. Uh, they're part of the, one of the coalitions uh, of the willing in the Middle East uh, for anti-piracy patrols and, and the like. 
So uh, their military, their navy, especially, uh, is is international, if you will. Yeah, small but uh, world class. Yes, I, I would, I would, that's a great characterization. I, I would agree with that. Small but world class. Uh, and uh, President Yoon has said that he he views uh, Korea as needing to step up on the international stage. Hmm. So uh, I think that uh, uh, that they have that capability, but th they are rightly focused uh, on the war that never ended. That's a good way to put it. Um, so recent news and, and intelligence reports are coming out that there's a, a renewed set of preparations for another North Korean nuclear weapons test. Um, you know, through my career in the military and, and since retiring, you know, U.S. Uh, attitudes and, and diplomacy towards North Korea have gone in you know, one direction and the other and back again numerous times, right? Um, and you know the, our previous president met with uh, the, the North Korean leader, uh, and then maybe nothing came of it. I'm just curious, your yeah. perspective. Um, is there anything that we can actually do, the United States, no matter who's in the White House, to dissuade, to deter North Korea from being the constant sort of two-year-old bad actor yeah. on the on the world stage? Yeah, it, I don't have the answer to that, yeah. uh, Bill. It's a great question. I, I do believe that. Kim Jong-un seeks four things. He seeks uh, sanctions relief, uh, he wants to keep his nukes, he wants to split the alliance, and he wants to dominate the peninsula. Um, and every action that he has taken since he has come to power uh, is reflective of that. The IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, last year uh, expressed concerns about the progress of the North Korean nuclear program. Uh, Averill Haynes, the Director of National Intelligence, uh, just this week spoke um, about uh, uh, the increasing capabilities uh, of, of that nuclear program and, um, and North Korea's intent to boost it. Right? Uh, and so I don't see uh, North Korea ever giving up its nuclear weapons. Yeah. And I think it's naive to think that we could convince them uh, to do that. So we're going to we're going to have to figure out a framework from which uh, we can uh, keep North Korea uh, in its box and, uh, and understand th that they're less likely to give up the nuclear weapons. Uh, I, I do think, you know, when I was the PACOM commander, I used to say that we want to bring Kim Jong-un to his senses and not to his knees. Uh, I think that's important. The previous administration, previous U.S. administration, uh, said, uh, frankly, that uh, we're not about regime change. So we can envision a world in which North Korea uh, exists and Kim Jong-un is in power. Uh, we can envision that. Uh, but, uh, we're gonna ha but I'm not smart enough to figure out how to, uh, how to do it, how to go about it. Uh, I do think, though, that, that, we, that the idea that we could somehow convince Kim Jong-un to give up his nuclear weapons freely, to freely give them up, uh, is naive. Um, uh, so w two of the things that I think it's important that we continue to do is we ne need to continue the sanctions, ratchet them up, make it hard and brutal, uh, harsh uh, and, uh, on North Korea. That, that could convince him to give them up or at least return to the negotiating table. And the other one is uh, we have to continue uh, with robust exercises with our South Korean ally uh, uh, against scenarios uh, that uh, could involve the North. Uh, a lot of these exercises were put on hold or downscaled during the last couple of years, uh, which I believe is a mistake. Uh, you know, U.S. forces, troops, are there on typically one-year rotations, so you need to continue to exercise uh, uh, capabilities with the South Korean military uh, as uh, uh, to be ready uh, in case uh, uh, the North invades again or, or, or does some, some kind of a provocation that's, that results in, in deaths and, and, and the like. Right. So we have to continue to do exercises and we have to continue to keep the harsh sanctions on. Now, if uh, we, and, and the other part of it is we have to keep the door open to the diplomacy with the North. And, and I think we have the, on the U.S. side and, the, and on the South Korean side. 
you know, come back to the negotiating table and let's, let's, have, a, let's have a negotiation. But the idea that you would somehow reduce sanctions or uh, reduce exercises as an inducement to get the North to come back to the table uh, is a proven road to failure. So if, if exercises are reduced or sanctions are reduced as an outcome of negotiations, uh, that's fine. That's why you have negotiations. Yeah. But don't give anything away ahead of time. Come back to the table and let's, let's start having a discussion about you know, where we're going to go together. So maybe uh, stick before the carrot. With, with Pyongyang, rather than the, the putting the carrots first? Yeah, I, I think stick with the carrot, but, but not the carrot first. Yeah. You're right. Or, yeah. yeah. Got it. Got so. it. Uh, well, sir, about a decade ago, 2010, 2011, you were the Sixth Fleet Commander. Um, yeah. So that was a few years before the uh, Russian invasion of, uh, of the Crimea. Um, at the time that you were Sixth Fleet Commander, did you foresee Anything like what we're seeing right now? Yeah, I'd like to be able to sit here and tell you I saw the future unfold yeah. before me, uh, but that would be a lie. I, I did not. Yeah. Uh, I, I was a six fleet commander from 2009 to 2011, so that's a dozen years ago. Uh, uh, that's before uh, Putin moved on uh, uh, on the Crimea, and certainly before he, he moved on uh, uh, on Ukraine writ large uh, and focused on the east. So I did not see that. As a matter of fact, I went to St. Petersburg uh, yeah, for the 65th anniversary of the end of the World War II, or as the Russians call it, the end of the Great Patriotic War. Right. Big celebration. Uh, I was treated very well, uh, and it was a, uh, a, a great uh, honoring uh, of our World War II ally, the Soviet Union, right. uh, and all of that. But uh, I did not foresee this then. Yeah. Um, was that uh, visit to St. Petersburg with a U.S. ship visit, or was it just? No, no. We, we brought a ship in. Uh, I flew in, yeah. uh, but we had a, a ship come in as well, um, and it was uh, just a, a great, great visit. You know, a great uh, uh, remembering of the sacrifices of both countries, right? Uh, and also a great way to honor in 2010 uh, those Soviet veterans who were still alive and proud of their service. Yeah, um, and so. Uh, you know, that was a different time. I think there was uh, uh, hope uh, was in the air. Hope was a course of action in 2010. It is no longer that now. It certainly is not. I, I was the naval attache in Moscow uh, in 2005 when it was the 60th anniversary of Gen Pabedi, as they yeah. say, Victory Day. Uh, and President George W. Bush and 50 other heads of state were in Red Square. Uh, we're at the Kremlin with, you know, President Putin celebrating the same thing, yeah. the, the victory over Nazi Germany. And uh, hope was in the air at that time, too. Uh, and then, you know, then a couple of years later was the, you know, the war in Georgia. And mm -hmm. that, that kind of soured things for a while, right? Uh, I, was, I was curious if, if we had ship visits back when you were the Sixth Fleet Commander. It sounds like they came back for a bit. And I know yeah. you've had none That's know, right. since 2014, since the Crimea yeah. uh, invasion. Yeah. Um, if you were Sixth Fleet Commander now, or maybe just, you know, walk us through the, the uh, kinds of decisions and thought processes, thinking through the, the situation, the Black Sea, the Sixth Fleet, the, it's a very constrained body of water, yeah. you've got the Montreux Convention, all those kinds of things. What, would, what do you think you would be asking for in terms well, of naval I mean, forces? I would, I would want to ask for things that... that, that uh, uh, gave me options, right? But, but I'd have to understand what my mission is. Sure. And, and the Sixth Fleet uh, doesn't get to set that mission. And that's a, that's a combatant commander responsibility. So it will come down from UCOM. Yep. It could come down through SACUR or through the Strike Force NATO, which is the other staff that Sixth Fleet commands. JFC Naples, uh, which is the four-star command in, in Naples, uh, that's also or ComNav UR. Uh, uh, Commander of Naval Forces Europe uh, would also be a part of that decision process. So it depends on what the mission. If the, if, sure. if the mission is defensive, uh, uh, it's one thing. If it's offensive, it's, it could be another thing. Uh, but I would ask for things that gave me that that flexibility to operate between th those left and right limits. Gotcha. Purely defensive, purely offensive, and everything in between. 
And that would mean, uh, you know, uh, from the Navy side, not the Joint side, because your question centered on Sixth Fleet. Uh, that would be a, the, uh, a carrier strike group, of course. Uh, the USS Mount Whitney, which is already there, the Sixth Fleet flagship, you need that command and control. Uh, it could be a unilateral a U.S. operation or an operation of the willing. It, it could be. I mean, I don't know. Yep. Uh, uh, and if it is, we'd have to get underway on the Mount Whitney, uh, 12 miles at least uh, off the coast of Italy, because you have to be in international waters because of uh, status of oh, forces agreements right, and right, all of that. Right. So if it's not a NATO operation, or if NATO is not, or if Italy is not part of the coalition of willing, that's why having uh, the U.S. flagship uh, in Sixth Fleet is so critical. Uh, so, you know, I'd, I'd want to make sure that Mount Whitney was, was uh, um, ready to go. Uh, I'd ask for a carrier strike group, probably ask for a submarine uh, just for that capability, and a lot of ISR, uh, whether it's uh, P-8s or uh, um, uh, EP-3s or Triton, mm -hmm. depending on the time frame. I'd, I'd ask for all of that because you, you want to have the maximum flexibility that you can have. Uh, it would be helpful to have uh, uh, a MU. You know, as long as I'm asking for everything, why not ask for everything, right? Sure. Yeah. So you'd want that capability uh, uh, resident on amphibious uh, lift uh, so that you, 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 you have a ready force if you need it. But uh, to be honest with you, uh, if there was a mission of that size uh, that was building uh, that, that was coming down from UCOM, then it would not be a, a, a Navy mission solely. It would be a joint mission. So you'd have joint ISR, you'd have joint enablers, uh, and all that. You'd have a joint task force commander at some level. Uh, it could be a three-star level. It could be a four-star level. Uh, I always used to say that, uh, that you don't want to start with a one-star JTF if you think the CNN is going to be involved, CNN effect. <laughs> if, you wanted, if you think that's going to happen, then you better have at least a three-star, maybe a four-star. Mm. So for Odyssey Dawn, that was the operation in Libya. Uh, Sam Locklear, who was the, the NAV Europe commander and the NAV Africa commander, yep. uh, was the Joint Task Force commander because Odyssey Dawn was an AFRICOM mission set. Right. So uh, th that's so. You, I think you want to start higher than you think you might need, uh, and then you can always ratchet it ratchet down. Back. Yep. But it's hard to increase it. Gotcha. So. Gotcha. And I guess uh, as a Sixth Fleet commander, uh, you would also be thinking about the other end of, of NATO uh, up north in the Baltic, right? right. So not just in the Black Sea or That's in the right. Eastern Med, but you've also got to think about uh, helping to defend. And you know, particularly a couple of months ago, when we didn't know how badly this was going to go for the Russians, there was a lot of concern yeah. for the, our, our Baltic NATO allies, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. Estonia, yeah, um, for sure. So uh, I think in this case, uh, what's happened in Ukraine uh, has been uh, a stunning um, um, overestimation of capabilities uh, by Russia. So uh, Putin overestimated uh, the, uh, his own capabilities. He, he overestimated uh, the strength of his army. Uh, he overestimated uh, the capabilities of his generals. Uh, he overestimated his own strategy, which was a fantasy of his own making, that he could blitzkrieg uh, uh, Ukraine in 15 days. He underestimated the resolve of the Ukrainian people. Uh, he might not think that Ukraine is independent, but the Ukrainians sure do, and they're willing to fight and die for their country. Uh, he underestimated the capability of the former comedian and every man who, who rose to his office uh, in Churchillian fashion. Yeah. Vladimir Zelensky is, is, is truly an amazing leader. And he, he demonstrates leadership uh, at every turn, in my opinion. Uh, and he underestimated, he, Putin, underestimated the, 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 the will of the American people uh, to come together in a bipartisan way in Washington uh, and get at the problem set to help Ukraine. He underestimated NATO, uh, especially Germany, uh, and its willingness to, uh, uh, to increase the pressure on Russia. And he underestimated countries like Finland and Sweden, uh, which are soon to become uh, a part of NATO. Uh, so 
in, in everything that, that, that Putin wanted to happen, you know, uh, uh, split the UN, split NATO, weaken NATO, uh, weaken the United States, uh, all, everything he, he wanted or perhaps expected to happen, let alone want it to happen, yeah. uh, did not happen. Uh, it's a stunning reversal in, in my view. Uh, and we, we're seeing that play out on the battlefield now. You know, there, there is a certain inevitability uh, to all of this. You know, I, I characterize where we are now uh, not as Czechoslovakia in 1968 or Hungary in 1956. This is really Finland in 1939. Mm. Uh, but there is a certain inevitability just because of the mass uh, of the Russian military. And, and I go back to Finland again. Now it's Finland 1940. So we have to, I think, uh, as, a, uh, as the United States, we have to, we must continue to support Ukraine uh, in every way that we can. And we are. You know, we, I think we started off a little slow, but we have picked up the, the, uh, the, the ball and run with it in, in, in great fashion. Howitzers, helicopters, um, uh, stingers, javelins, the whole thing. And then uh, other countries... Uh, with capabilities or joining the fight uh, with equipment uh, for Ukraine. So I think that's important. Yeah, it's been impressive to watch. Yeah, it has been. Um, and over time, we'll have to see where it goes. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that we're supporting uh, Ukraine, um, and I'm glad that other countries are doing the same. I agree. Well, sir, I mentioned that, that you have just joined the board of the Naval Institute. So last question for you. <laughs> um, you know, in your service uh, to the country and to the Navy, your time as a midshipman and as an officer. Um, you know, how did you interact with the Naval Institute and how did proceedings or other things that the Naval Institute did uh, maybe impact you and any, any advice you might have for our readers, listeners, members, and future authors? Yeah, so, so in, the, in the things that, uh, that the Naval Institute uh, uh, asks or calls out really to, to members and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the country at large to do, uh, to think, uh, to read, to speak and to write. Speak and write. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, uh, two of those I do okay. <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, that I uh, 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 read and speak uh, okay. Uh, your audience should be the judge of that, I guess. Uh, I think I do thinking uh, only a a average or adequately, barely adequately, and I don't write at all. So I, if, if you add that up, I think it's a low C. <laughs> uh, but, but I do uh, applaud the Institute for all the things that, that it's about. So I've been a member of the Institute since uh, 1978, life member, uh, and I think that uh, I believe uh, that the Institute has helped me over time. Uh, you know, uh, uh, when you read the debates, really, that are ongoing in the pages of proceedings, uh, that's important stuff. And you'll, you'll find over time that the issues that we're confronting in the military today were actually debated, the big issues, force structure issues and uh, things like that, uh, were actually debated in the pages of proceedings before that. So you can get a pretty good idea of what the next big issues are. Uh, if you read proceedings. Is that because proceedings is informing that debate or is it because there are people smart enough to think, write, uh, read, uh, and all of that ahead of time? Uh, and uh, they're predicting the future debate. I think it's a little of both. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the proceedings has helped me a lot. Uh, I, I, I enjoy reading about history and trying to learn from history. And, and sure enough, there, there's, a, there's a subset of that for people like me. Sure. Uh, Naval History uh, uh, magazine. So uh, it has meant a lot to me uh, over time. Uh, and, uh, and I've been the beneficiary uh, of all the other people's uh, thinking and writing. Well, one of my favorite stories uh, to, to that point is uh, you know, the story that um, many of the thought leaders and, and future uh, strategic level leaders of the sea services wrote for proceedings early in their careers, right, right. before they were famous. And, uh, you know, an example to your point, uh, Lieutenant uh, Chester Nimitz in 1912 
uh, wrote about how submarines were going to change the future of naval warfare. So think about that. Lieutenant Chester Nimitz, yeah. not Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz. And in 1912, not in 1940, you know, thinking about submarines. But Yeah, well, I, 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 I admire those people uh, that can do that. And uh, not only Chester Nimitz, but uh, Jim Stavridis, prolific writer, prolific thinker. Uh, Sandy Winnefeld, prolific writer, prolific thinker. Uh, and uh, I'm just a prolific reader. So, Well, thanks for being a reader. And thanks for being a life member. And also for, for joining our board of directors, sir. It's great to have you. Yeah, it's great to be a part of this team. So thank you very much. All right. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast. Until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.